when civilizations die, it always begins with the money, or more specifically, the corruption of money. In this video, I hope to explain in simple terms why this is and where Western civilization is at at this particular time. Spoiler alert, we're much closer to barbarism than freedom. Sorry. The first thing we need to do is understand just what civilization is. Imagine an island with a single person. We'll name him Peter. In order to survive, Peter has to do everything himself. Build shelters, hunt for food, etc. Life is hard and unforgiving when you are forced to do everything for yourself. Now imagine another person arrives on our island. We'll call him Paul. It doesn't take long before Peter and Paul decide it makes sense to work together to survive. Peter focuses on fishing, while Paul focuses on farming. By specializing like this, Peter and Paul get very good at their individual jobs as they're able to concentrate on them. They're able to produce much more individually and then trade with each other. Both benefit, and life becomes much easier. This is why we all prefer to live in societies rather than as individuals on islands. As societies become more complex, the trades become more complicated. This is why money is introduced. Money is a medium of exchange, nothing more. It is a representation of how much the work you did is valued by others through voluntary exchange. When you present someone with money to make a purchase, you are literally saying, I produced this much, I will now like to exchange it for what you produced. Once again, money is a medium of exchange and nothing more. Let's go back to Peter and Paul and let's get them each $10 to represent their work instead of fish and grain. When a society starts to grow, it makes sense to pool your resources to do a few things collectively, like police and firefighters. This is how government gets introduced into the equation. For taxes of only a dollar each, the government is able to provide these basic services to everyone on the island. So far, so good. However, the stake in the grass is that government responds to different incentives than either Peter or Paul. Peter and Paul get ahead by offering more goods and services at lower prices that people are willing to voluntarily exchange for. A democratically elected government does not do this. In order for it to get ahead, it needs to buy votes, which is what it starts to do. So, the government goes to Peter and says, Vote for me. What do you want from me for free? Getting free stuff from the government instead of having to work for it sounds good to Peter, so he says, I want a free education. The government then says the same thing to Paul. Vote for me and I'll give you what you want for free. This also sounds good to Paul, so he says, I want free health care. The government smiles to both and says, no problem. I'm here to serve you and your wish is my command. There is a problem though and that the government has no money of its own. It can only get money from Peter and Paul to offer its free services, which is exactly what it does. At first it reaches into Peter's wallet and takes $5. It then gives $1 to Paul and says, here's your free health care. Paul is pretty happy about this until the government reaches into his wallet and takes $5 as well. The government then gives $1 to Peter and says, here's your free education. Peter and Paul look at each other and realize what has happened. They each only have $6 and the government has $8. This is why the great French economist Frederick Bastat noted that government is the great fiction through which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else. Both Peter and Paul realize it is better for them to get their own edu education and health care through the free market rather than the massively inefficient government, which is what they decide to do. This is how honest money constrains the scope and size of a government. This makes the government unhappy though and it looks for a way to break the constraints of honest money. It does this by convincing Peter and Paul to allow it to print money. The next time it offers goods and services for free, it doesn't have to do it through honest taxation. It can be done by printing money, which it then proceeds to do. The next time it offers free health care and education for votes, it only taxes them $2 each. However, the government now prints an additional $6. Now when the government gives Peter and Paul each their $1 of health care and, and education, each now has $9 and the government has $8. At first this almost appears to be magic, as Peter and Paul are now getting their free services. 
However, the government itself has not produced any new goods or services. All it has done is dilute the money, which is really the work Peter and Paul have done via counterfeiting. Before they realize it, prices start to rise and Peter and Paul are not nearly as far ahead as they thought. This is called inflation, and what it is is a really sticky form of government taxation. This is bad enough, but the government doesn't stop there. Every election brings new opportunities for the government to offer more free things and programs in exchange for votes. It continues to tax producers like Peter and Paul in order to buy votes from everyone else in order to build the warfare welfare state. As the state grows, more and more people find it easier to align with the state than work through the voluntary exchange of the free market. Crony capitalism, counterproductive government programs, and corruption become the norm. It starts slowly, but over time more and more people try and live off fewer and fewer producers. This continues until the whole house of cards collapses. This is what has occurred in countries like Greece and Venezuela today, and is the path the entire Western world is on at the moment. The solution? We need a return to honest government and a virtuous society. This means the removal of the original corruption, dishonest government money. It always begins with the money. Hopefully we'll learn our lesson one day. Thank you.